So welcome everyone to ITE's, ITE Manitoba's second webinar to be held during these COVID times. Welcome also to my living room. Um, my name is Jennifer Chapman and I am the Traffic Analysis Engineer with Manitoba Infrastructure, as well as the current president of ITE Manitoba. We definitely miss seeing everyone at our usual luncheon location, but looking, up, but looking on the bright side, and boy, do we all need a bright side these days. Uh, we are excited about having three fabulous speakers joining forces this afternoon from both Winnipeg and Montreal. I also wanted to thank Rebecca Paterniak, our current secretary at IT Manitoba, and Stephen Garner at CITE for helping to make this webinar event possible. Now on to today's presentation on school travel planning. Um, our first speaker is Marie Soleil Cloutier. Marie Soleil is a health geographer and associate professor in urban studies at, pardon my bad French accent, at Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Montreal. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was coached by my two boys who are in a French immersion school. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Her research focuses on the impact of the built environment on health and her prime interests are issues related to the pedestrian injuries, related to pedestrian injuries and road risk perceptions. As director of the Pres Pedestrian and Urban Space Lab, she is currently involved in several multidisciplinary research teams working on examining issues related to pedestrians of all ages, but most especially seniors, children and others classified as at risk. Most of her research projects are in collaboration with community partners and other researchers in Quebec and France. Marie Soleil's presentation is entitled, Child Pedestrian Safety Around Schools and Parks. What to worry or not about. Um, so go ahead, Marie, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, Deborah. Okay, let's see if I can do that two times within the same. Um, all right, so you can see my presentation. And it's yeah. moving forward. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as I was saying earlier, I put a dress on. I'm at work. I'm like super excited about this. Um, I would have been happier to be in Winnipeg, I guess, uh, with some of my friends there um, that we met, uh, that I met the last year at Mode Shift, but still really a pleasure to be online today. So um, today I'm going to present to you about. Uh, uh, several, well, it's a project that had different branches, let's say, but it's really based on children's behavior depending on different bits of environment and their interactions with drivers and where we should worry or how we can actually improve this whole risk and risk perception um, idea that especially near schools, but also around parks, uh, if you want to move forward with more kids walking and obviously no kids being injured when they do, they're doing this. So I'm going to go really quickly over two basic principles that I think all of you online already know, uh, hopefully. So the first one is road risk, which is a public health problem. I think um, you're not surprised by that, obviously. But I use the, the iceberg um, image often because basically right now, the tool we have to look at road safety and at how we how it's a problem and where it's a problem, it's collisions. But those collisions are only the tip of the iceberg. All those conflicts underneath the water um, are sometimes quite dangerous because they're near misses, because uh, they scare kids, they mostly because they scare parents also, to be honest. And, and then that would reduce the active transport, for instance. So we need to work on the collisions, obviously, but we also need to work on those conflicts that do occur as soon as you're in a city, I would say. It doesn't have to be even a busy neighborhood um, because we do, um, we do have a, a restrained space where pedestrians and, and, um, and drivers do you, you use both of them use the same space basically obviously we're supposed to be on the sidewalk but as you might know there's no sidewalks everywhere 
The second major principle that I want to um, stress here before we get to um, what we found is that crossing a street is complicated. And we tend to forget that when we're grown ups and when we just do it because we've been doing it forever. But basically, in your brain, the task that you need to do before you decide to cross and where you, you should cross and when are, are there's there's four of those tasks the choose the right location to cross analyze traffic, estimate distance, find a gap to cross, and foresee others' behavior. And um, next time you're gonna, you, you, you'll cross the street, just think about all that, that, that you do in your brain in a few seconds most of the time, except maybe if you're at a light and then you would maybe base your decisions on the light, for instance, but still, every day we walk in, the, in cities even in rural areas, and when we have to cross, we, we do those four tasks. The problem with children, and to, to be honest, I usually have also another column with seniors because there's similarities here between the, the youngest and the oldest of our society, is that um, it, 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 this whole task is based on how you can listen, how you can see, how you can judge others' behavior, and how you're self-conscious of your own speed and capacity speed of walking to cross, for instance. And all this is different with kids because the brain maturity is not there till at least 12, sometimes even we'll say 14 in some infants. And even for seniors the same, but that, for the seniors, it's more the, the losing of some of those capacity. In terms of the first one, well, that would be pretty much the same for adults. You know, we would go for the short, shortest path. Maybe when we walk with friends, we would be a little bit distracted, maybe by our phone also, let's say. And then the fear of stranger, stranger danger is not that much from kids, but from their parents, obviously. So choose the right location to cross means that you do have a path that is fulfilling all your your um, your the conditions that you want to let your kids walk, for instance, to school. So having this in mind, I want to talk to you about some insight we got from our research, uh, research we're doing here in Quebec. I have an, um, I, I'm also involved in a pan-Canadian uh, team that is in Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. Um, but that team is more on active transport and collisions. So today, I really want to talk to you about what we do in Quebec in, in terms of a, a different um, method. But if you're interested in the Chase uh, project, that's the name of that's the little acronym for this project that is, has a really long name, uh, please, please feel free to um, to reach out. I know um, Jamie is also going to talk about um, his old stuff, but he's he's on our board also at Cars, uh, uh, Chase. Sorry. So we base our research on observations. Um, basically, because of that collision tip of the iceberg problem, uh, we decided to go in the field and look at people crossing. Because for every, I don't know how many crossing, we would have a collision that got, and even within those collisions, we would have even a smaller proportion of people that would be injured. And usually, this, these are the ones that we get in stats. But when it happens there, that means there's a whole bunch of people that might just have random interaction, dangerous interactions at the same location. And this is when why we wanted to go outside and see what, what's happening there. So we did five cities. Well, Montréal and Laval are in the same, um, uh, and Longueuil are the same big metropolitan region, basically. It's South Shore and Laval is a Northern Ireland. Then we went to Quebec City and we went to Gatineau also. We had almost 300 crossing sites. They were near schools, but also be we wanted to look at schools and seniors and adults in the middle because we wanted to compare the, the three age groups. So we went also near pharmacy, which is a really good spot if you want to see seniors. And then um, we also tried to have some of those sites that were in urban core and in more a suburb type of urban form. We had more than 4,000 observations within basically two months because we were there May and June um, because we wanted school to be on. Well, we actually also went in July to get a, a little bit more seniors and adults, actually, but obviously the kids were more May and June. And um, we were looking at the crossing at tr three specific phases. I would say there's a fourth one. So basically how it works is that you're on the sidewalk or on the corner if there's no sidewalk and you look at the pedestrians walking towards you crossing towards you i should say and then um uh, we looked at them when they were approaching the curb when they were starting 
the 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 crossing basically before and when they were putting their foot on the street and then while they were crossing we were looking at them in the middle pretty much and then at the end of it we were also looking at uh, some characteristics so with those four phases let's say of the crossing it happens really quickly you know uh, we train our observers and um, we did some inter um, judge inter-observation reliability, I can't remember the name in English specifically, uh, just to make sure that everybody looked at the same things. Uh, we were looking at the individual characteristics, obviously, but also at basically their behavior and their interactions with a car. You can see here, actually, the blue line and the red line, and, and we, we collected one interaction every time a pedestrian was still on the street, but the car was passing in front or behind the pedestrian. Um, so basically those two lines were crossing. If those two lines were crossing when the pedestrians was on the street, not on the sidewalk or not on the other side, we were counting this as an interaction or a conflict, let's say. We also did a second wave during the winter where we went to do some walkabouts with the kids. Um, so winter time was pretty interesting because basically we didn't want to go in the winter at first, but it took so long to organize the thing and have the ethics approval from the school boards that we, we ended up doing it in February. But in the end, it was actually pretty good because they had a lot of comments also about the winter time and about what it was doing to their neighborhood basically and even to some of the measures that were it put in place to make it safer and then in the winter became a little bit obsolete and you can see well you know winter over there too right so you can see for instance that some marking on the ground would be totally useless right now on that picture obviously so what did we find what did we find about um several things first and we knew that already, right? But children are not perfect pedestrians. I'm not sure who's a perfect pedestrian anyway, perfect all the time even, uh, especially when where they were looking. So basically we were looking at their gaze pretty much or, or their head if it was too hard. Um, and before crossing, there's a little more than 20% of them that didn't, didn't even look at the cars coming, which is what we learn usually, right? Uh, as soon as we are out and about. And in the middle, a third of them were looking at the ground. Sometimes it's really useful, especially maybe in Montreal where we got a lot of potholes so you don't fall. But still, this means that they were maybe not aware of the surrounding environment and what was happening in it. Um, it, this this result has to be put in the perspective of two things. For half of the kids we looked, almost half, 40%, um, there was an adult school crossing guard that was helping them crossing. And those kids were looking, were less looking at their environment because they were kind of like trusting the crossing guard, I would say. And another um, uh, effect that we saw is that um, a lot of them were with their parents. Almost 75% of them were accompanied by a parent. This is a lot, uh, this is a bit preoccupying for um, mobility and autonomy in their mobility of the kids um, because it was little ones, big ones, like there was a lot of parents that were walking with them. I, I'm not sure if it's a good or a bad news, to be honest, because we really want to foster that that independent mobility from the kids. But at the same time, if it's unsafe, I can totally understand that parents wants to go with them, basically. Uh, this highlights, so um, just to be back for a second, this also highlights the fact that we need to go beyond the fact that we they can learn to be better pedestrians. And this is, um, basically what Vision Zero is, is proposing, that we put the burden on the system instead of on all the individuals to get better. And this is also the case for drivers, you know, because there's no perfect drivers out there, or maybe, maybe one or two, but I would say I highly doubt that, right? So the idea here was, was that basically, if we only do education for kids, we're never going to get to the point that they will be all the time safe or even that they will walk more and or bike more because it's it's the system and the built environment that is that is wrong part of it at least part of the problem is that basically uh, secondly well 
that's the good news though, because children were less involved in interactions with vehicles. Um, so we had pretty much 10% of the observations that were interactions for, for kids, and it goes more towards 20, 25% for adults and seniors. Um, this is good news, and maybe this is, um, uh, we, not maybe, actually, we know that, again, two effects. The adult school crossing guard, their job is to actually get the kids safely on the other side of the street. And we saw that if we control for that presence of a school crossing guards, like those those interactions were always going, were almost going down to zero, basically. So it works, but they're not there all the time. Obviously, they're there three, four hours a day, a day during weekdays only, not during summer. So they can palliate to some maybe really dangerous inter intersections, but they they are not. They're just part of the big solutions I was just talking about in terms of system. Secondly, we know that there's a lots of things happening around schools, 30 kilometer zones, some traffic calming, especially in Montreal. It's getting more and more there um, and also uh, uh, maybe a safety by number effect that is coming in. So that all that combined might explain actually that lower proportion of interactions with children. Then why? <laughs> Obviously, I just gave a little bit of a of um, of, of uh, con content here, but um, really quickly, I have a few points that I want to pass by, and those all the pictures I'm going to show you in the next few minutes are from the field, basically. So um, so here you have a typical 1970s uh, suburb of Montreal. It's on the island, though, so it's not super far. And the school is actually on the right. If you turn right at that stop sign, basically, the school is right there. Um, and um, in terms of visibility, a few things were really um, happening I would say almost too often when we were in the field. The, for instance, a, par, a car was parked at the corner. Sometimes it was parked illegally. For instance, uh, we do in Montreal paint yellow, the five meter exclusion on the corners. But if it's only paint, you know how it goes. Sometimes people do park there. But also if you're in a suburb like that, there's no painting all over the place. So people park all the way to the corners. And what we, we, we get is that when there was park cars, then there was more interactions. Typical case here, obviously here you're a little bit above because that's a Google uh, map uh, picture. But um, let's say you're a car and you get to the stop. A kid that was basically hidden behind this um, this minivan was just like starting to cross. And sometimes there's a stop, obviously, right? So you're supposed to stop and let the kids go in front of you. But we saw a lot of occasion where the, the kid was not maybe far enough, I guess. And then people were just stopping and turning right or left way before the kids. But this is kind of a, sometimes it was not that far from the kid, basically. Again, in terms of visibility, when we when we actually walk, so I'm, I just added in those um, different slides the 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 walkabout results also. So what the kids told us when they were when we were with them on the street. So um, all those physical measures that really change basically the 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 space given to pedestrians. Kids were like super uh, honest about them, straightforward, you know. I noticed that there, there's flower containers, so cars can get up on the sidewalk. This is a good news, you know. You can you can get closer, to, and and as a pedestrian, when you're there, you can get closer to the road. Driver can see you more. You can see them too. Um, and then speed bumps, they're they're really useful, you know, because cars they have to slow down. Even another kid told us he's like nobody wants to break its, his car, you know. So nobody, everybody's gonna slow down for sure with those measures. So they were pretty like down to earth, you know, but that was pretty refreshing because, you know, as researchers, sometimes we kind of look way too far and then they're like, yeah, well, you know, it's going to work, you know, you don't want to break your car. I'm like, yeah, that's, that, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, kids were also really skeptical about, skeptical about signs and lines. And I know that cities, you know, if you have a low budget and you want to do something, it's maybe better than nothing, let's say, for some places. But, the, but in terms of safety and in terms of like even difference on the risk perception, it doesn't do much. You know? They let drivers don't get punished for not following them, you know. They, they should stop, but they don't. Um, and, and one kid was saying, you know, there's kids on the signs, especially around schools, there's lots of those signs, but they're like, well, 
us kids, there are tons of them on the street, you know, just look at us and you're not going to hit us. Basically. Again, really don't hurt. Um, and then the, the winter came, you know, and they're like, they're, there's, they're not always cleared of snow, all those signs and lines. So uh, it's not too useful if you don't see the, the painting, basically. Then traffic. Interesting enough, when we talk to the kids, there and to be honest, also when we talk to adults sometimes, there's a difference between traffic, like the amount of, of cars passing through, and speed of those cars. And people m really mix those two, um, those two indicators, be because it's not their job, like, like it's our job to know the difference between the two. So what we saw is that major roads, like arterial roads, right now I put an arrow here, basically behind the church there's a school. So this is a major arterial road, Christophe Collard, for those of you who know Montreal, and this is Beaubien. This is um, even a, a, a tricky place for the pedestrians collisions even. So I was talking about, about um, uh, conflicts earlier, but this one is even really bad for collisions. And, and obviously, you wouldn't be surprised that um, we found that major roads like that are related to more interactions. Uh, there's a lot of turning right, turning left, sometimes, especially the turning left, as you as you might know already, um, people don't wait for, for the pe pedestrians to pass. They're just looking at the gap between the cars, basically. Kids were really concerned about the speed, but as I was saying, it's speed and traffic at the same time. You know, there were like at, at that specific corner, they're like, I don't really feel safe here you know, to be honest. So I, I wouldn't sometimes, to be honest, either. And then trucks. Interesting enough, like we didn't look like around schools, you know, usually it's not a truck. Um, it's not a truck path. Sometimes there's some exclusions. Obviously, as we just saw in the, in the picture before, uh, some of the schools are on ter arterial roads, you know, we just they were built there way before it was a major street, you know, but um, but they were really concerned about trucks and also about delivery trucks. The fact that the sidewalk is not free, especially for the kids that were going through, for instance, some commercial arterial, local commercial arterial roads. So they're not too big as streets, and that makes conflicts between the the delivery people and then some parking spots that might not be um, uh, used. So they just go on the sidewalk sometimes on the corner also. They, they, they turn the corner and kind of park there to do their delivery. So they're like, this is not fun. We have to walk in the street to cross. It's not working for us. And um, they were really concerned about the trucks. And a big truck for them sometimes is just a small truck for delivery. Um, then stop signs, they were related to more interactions compared to traffic light, obviously. And this is, again, especially because, it, well, in Montreal, we don't have the turn uh, right on red. So basically, if you're at an intersection with a traffic light, usually you have more of a gap to do your crossing before getting involved in an interaction. This is not the case with a, with a stop sign. First, because a lot of drivers do really, really quick stop. <laughs> Um, and also, and and it's for like it's just more fluid, obviously, when you have a stop sign. Here you have a school that is right on the other side of the stop sign again. But uh, as you know, there's nobody there on my picture, on my photo here. However, 15 minutes before the clock rings uh, to get the school, this place is so busy that it's really hard to cross. Sometimes even the cross, the adult crossing guards were like, man, I'm giving up sometimes. It's just too busy, but it only lasts 15 minutes. So obviously, to rebuild the whole intersections for those 15 minutes might be hard to justify. However, um, if we don't do this, then how are we going to get the kids there? You know, um, So it's hard decisions, I know. And if you have comments later, I'm really open to listen to your solutions to that because it is a real problem around schools. Obviously, what we need is to lower down the number of cars that are coming, but it's kind of a vicious circle of like, well, it's not safe because there's cars. So I'm going to drive my kids. But then because I drive my kids, I, I actually contribute to that, to that car traffic around the school. So to break this, this vicious circle is pretty hard, obviously. Uh, funny enough, so as you can see here, uh, we're kind of in the back of the school and there's not much, right? And on the front of the school, there was a whole bunch of things, uh, some um, curb extension, uh, specific signs even. Uh, I'm not sure there was a flashing beacon, but um, there was for sure like super fluorescent signs. And then kids were like, okay, it's stupid. One street has everything and the next one has nothing. 
And sometimes, you know, interesting enough, they've decided, for instance, to put a lot in the front of the school because the kids were coming from the other side. But then a few years later, you know how it's changing for elementary school, especially. Then the kids were coming from the other side of the neighborhood where there's where there's there's no intervention. This this might be a good opportunity to actually um, add some more inter interventions on the built environment on the other side of the school. And after a few years, then you're done with all the sides of it. Uh, but the kids for sure were just like, how come it's not the same everywhere around my school? Then bike infrastructures related to more interactions. Um, uh, kids are worried about safety when biking. Um, uh, they have sometimes to go on the sidewalk or they want to do go on the sidewalk because they don't feel safe on the street. This is a school. The school is actually one block uh, past that, that building. And basically, the, the even the crossing guards are, told us about like the fact that they find it really hard to if there's a lot of adults biking even. So the kids can use the bike path, but then they would stop in front of the school and then it's doing a whole bunch, bunch of, of messing um, between the adults biking that are going pretty faster, et cetera. So the bike infrastructures, um, we build them a lot and I think it's a good idea for our, street, our cities, but we um, we might need to be careful around schools when we uh, we build them. And then school crossing guards, less interactions. I already told you that, and I think I'm out of time anyway. So let's see um, what I can do in two minutes. Um, then, okay, so other destinations. So after going around schools, we decided to go around a few parks. And what we found there was pretty depressing, if I can say, because basically we don't have the same, well, at least in Montreal, I know that a uh, in different places, for instance, and I think in Calgary, they have the same, legis not legislation, but uh, in um, uh, around park and school is the same uh, uh, bylaw, I guess. Um, here, for instance, hold on, I'm going to show you that. Um, so basically, you have here a, an intersection that is that has traffic lights, even pedestrian lights, it's easy to cross and get to the park. But if you live north of the park and you want to cross here, then you have nothing and it's a huge arterial road to cross, or else, well, what you can do, what you have to do is going all the way down and cross here and they go all the way up because the kids park is up there. So it seems that around parks, there's a lot that we can do better. What we found is basically 80% of, uh, we're almost at the level of the adults interactions where we're, when we were around parks. It's not surprising because there's not much going on around. And we also had a, Parks are used as shortcuts by kids to go to school sometimes. So it's not just like the Sunday afternoon that you pass with your friends at the park. It's just that if they use it every day, maybe we should think a bit more about how to get there safely, basically. Okay, so last slide. Um, basically, I think we have to question the space given to cars and cities. This is kind of above everything that I saw today. I said today, right? The road width, the curve radius, the parking, the sidewalks. I, to be honest, it's already happening. It's already happening in a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of cities. And um, sometimes people ask me where to start them because it's just too much. You know, we have so many neighborhoods we should rebuild then. Um, what we are trying to push around, at least in Montreal, is that we do a lot of street reconfiguration. I mean, we do a lot of reconstruction, especially for sewage system lately, because really old sewage system are just like done. And then the problem is that we sometimes rebuild the, the street exactly the same way it was built in the 1960s. This is the th kind of thing we should avoid, I think. I think yes, sometimes when you think about it, anyway, we have to open the streets for some renovation, then don't do it the same way. I really like this picture. I think you might have seen it already, the snack down effect, we say. Pretty easy. You put a little bit, a few inches of snow, and then you wait for a few days without plowing it, and it gives you all the space that is giving to cars that is not used by cars, basically. So that's a New York um, uh, one, but I've got a few more of those of those um, uh, pictures all around the place, and it's quite interesting when you see the space we give to them that they don't use, basically, to give to cars that we don't use. All right, that's it. Sorry, I wasn't too long. Oh, no, no problem. Thank you, Marie. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to use the chat. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes, but in the meantime, um, question I have is why is Vision Zero a better strategy to tackle road risk? 
Well, I, I, I talk a bit about it. It's just um, what is interesting is, as I was saying, like the burden of the safety, not well, it's getting more and more different than that. But let's say in the 90s, even early 2000s, the burden of safety was on individuals. And it was just in road safety. It wasn't just in road safety. You know, we call them the, like in public health, we call them the Reagan era, you know, of this. 80s and 90s where basically if you were not healthy it was your fault right so uh we still have this this reflex in road safety that we need to get rid of because it's you can you can have a, a bad behavior obviously but what we find sometimes is that like when people don't cross at this at the crossing for instance it's it's because it's too far it's because it's not well suited for them um so and sometimes it's just because they don't want to follow the rules, obviously, and we don't want to, let's say, encourage that. But at the same time, we need to have a look at this in a more global way, in a system way. From the person who draw the new street in a new neighborhood that doesn't think it would be used by anything else than cars, to the pedestrians themselves and drivers themselves that needs to behave, obviously, right? So I, I really like this idea of that we're all part of the solution, also that because that we're all part of the problem, from the, the, the conception to the use of it, basically. Great. I don't see any questions coming in. Um, that's the case. Stephen, do you see any? Maybe I'm somehow missing them. I don't think so. But. Nope. You can always open it up again at the end of the session. And yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Marie. It was very interesting, especially to hear the kids' perspective on these different measures. They definitely tell it like it is. Yes. <laughs> it's important to listen to them once in a while. Yep. Thank you. Our, moving on then, our second speaker is Danae Penner. Danae is the Senior Program Coordinator at Green Action Center in Winnipeg. She is an environmentalist and outdoor enthusiast with 10 years of experience in event and program management. She is a University of Winnipeg graduate with a degree in environmental studies and active transportation and urban sustainability issues. Her work focuses on equitable transportation, children's mobility and authentic par public participation. Outside of work, she is an avid skier and runner and explores Manitoba with her dog, Rhubarb. Danae's presentation will focus on an ongoing Winnipeg pilot project at Isaac Brock School regarding school streets, which is an innovative approach to support student health and safety. It's all yours now, Danae. Feel free to share your screen. Okay, just give me one second. Um, okay, so I gotta go back to the start here. Uh, so I work at Green Action Center. Um, I work with the Active and Safe Routes to School program and we started a school streets pilot project this fall in Winnipeg. Um, so just really quickly, um, what I'll talk about today, I'll talk about briefly about Green Action Center and the work that we do. And then I'll talk in detail about the school streets project, um, looking at the planning and logistics the communications and promotion that we did for the project uh, within the community, some of our early observations and the kind of evaluation and feedback that we're currently working on um, because the project is still, still going, it hasn't yet ended. Um, so I work with Active and Safe Routes to School and that is a project within the sustainable transportation umbrella at Green Action Center. And we work with teachers, schools, um, school divisions, families, and kind of entire school communities to encourage increased rates of active school travel. So we use programs, events, and education to help remove some barriers to increased rates of walking and biking. Um, and as Marie Soleil mentioned earlier, that like some of the limitations there are built environment. So we're kind of working for towards new projects and initiatives that go beyond education because you can't um, make really big leaps and bounds without changing the infrastructure that people are navigating day to day. Um, so we're looking for some new ways to start supporting schools, especially right now with the pandemic. Schools are experiencing a lot of limitations with transportation, um, shifting, shifting and busing and what's available for families. And then changes to the number of students that are going to school and kind of some of the limitations around that too. Um, so we started looking at school streets as an option for Winnipeg. 
And a school street is a temporary closure to vehicle traffic on the street in front of a school. And it was an initiative that started in the United Kingdom, but they've been adopted quite rapidly around the world through, through the last couple of months um, as a really great way to support students' safe, safety and to provide some increased space for maybe outdoor class or outdoor playtime. Um, in our climate, outdoor class isn't something that we can really look at, but that is something that's working for cities in other parts of the world. So with the school street here, um, we looked at kind of some, some different things that would be good for Winnipeg. And based on pilots that were studied around the world, primarily a lot of them in the UK, um, the Pilots show that there is an increased safe physical distancing space, um, which is really important for children as they're queuing before they go into class. Increased safety for kids who are walking, biking, and busing to school. And a number of pilots um, demonstrated a reduce in car traffic in the community as a whole. So I think one concern with closing a street to vehicle traffic is that that traffic will just get displaced. But because such a large portion of traffic around a school is from people driving their children to school, if you encourage them to walk or bike, it just means that there's fewer cars on the road. And so traffic congestion um, becomes less of a, a struggle as a whole. There's improved air quality and reduced noise pollution, which is really great for creating a more pleasant street environment, which makes it feel more safe, especially for kids. And a better school experience. There's a strong correlation between physical activity and how kids uh, act during the day or their level of concentration. So if you can find ways for kids to be active on the way to school, often the classroom experience is a lot better, which is an important component for us to consider if we're working on supporting schools because schools are under a lot of pressure right now and classrooms are functioning in a very different way than they have in the past. So uh, reducing behavioral issues that might happen in the classroom is a really great benefit to schools. And then of course, increased facility activity to support children's health um, from increased walking rates. So for the planning for a school street in Winnipeg, um, I started with engaging stakeholders to kind of assess feasibility overall for um, what it might look like in Winnipeg and if we could ever get it off the ground. So I talked to some people at the city of Winnipeg, some of the traffic engineers are with us today that I um, pick their brains for different things that might impact a uh, school street happening here or be a limiting factor and how I could work around those. I talked to city councillors to see if we could get support primarily with funding um, to try to get a couple of school streets going in the city. I talked with parent councils and school administrators, particularly principals. It's really difficult to do anything with the school if you don't have the buy-in of a principal or their dedication to getting the program going. And of course, we talked to the school division once we knew which schools we wanted to be working in and what division would be involved. So I was quite surprised and pleased to, after talking with all these various stakeholders that it looked like a school street would be plausible for Winnipeg. And this was in the spring um, when the pandemic was still very new to a lot of people and schools were still totally closed or mostly closed. So engaging with the schools was a little bit difficult to do because they weren't open. Um, but it was exciting to see that the ones I was able to talk to were really keen on looking at a school street. So once I knew that it was possible, I started eliminating or selecting schools that would be good candidates for a school street. So I looked at a number of um, criteria. The first was the grade of the school. They're most beneficial to elementary schools. So there was no need to look at schools that didn't have elementary students. Um, looking at the school's commitment to walking and biking initiatives and their overall rates of active school travel. So is the school committed to increasing walking rates? Um, do they already have some programs or initiatives that are going to support students that they want to keep walking to school throughout the winter? Um, and then we looked at an evidence of safety issues or any kind of road safety concerns. So would there be a school that could really benefit from a street that was closed to vehicles, would that be safer for the students that go to that school? Um, school capacity, are they engaged with the parent council? Do they have parent council that really wants to be making um, leaps and bounds for their students? Um, are there more emergent issues that would take priority over a school street closure or any kind of new pilot project? Um, and then of course we looked at a suitable street. So to kind of narrow that list down, I think I started with about 12 or 15. Um, the city traffic engineers helped by looking at a suitable street location in front of a school 
And from that long list, we narrowed it down to two. So the first was David Livingston, which is an elementary school in the north end of Winnipeg. Unfortunately, um, the school declined having a school street pilot, and that was because of the pandemic. They were concerned about the stress that was already being placed on teachers, and they didn't want to try to incorporate anything new, given that their students and the school community as a whole was quite stressed and really nervous about the start of the school year in the fall. So we did go ahead with a school street at Isaac Brock School, which was really exciting. Um, I'm still pumped that it's happening. So Isaac Brock is a school in the West End of Winnipeg. It's a nursery to grade nine, which is pretty unusual that it's such a wide age range. But having such a large portion of elementary students, the fact that there are middle years there kind of didn't deter us from wanting to do it at that school. And this um, graph here is a snapshot of the active school travel rates at Isaac Brock. So this is from our bike walk roll survey, which is an online hands up survey that schools are able to do anytime with their students. And this is a kind of a summary from the last few years. So about 61% of the students walk to Isaac Brock, which is a really high walking rate. And we want to make sure that those students are able to continue doing that through all months of the year. Um, and then especially with changes in protocol about how they need to wait outside before school starts every morning right now. So once we had this school select, uh, selected, I started looking at some of the logistics of how is this going to happen? And I had some chats and meetings with the parent council and with the teachers and the school administrators, and we narrowed it down to a Monday to Friday street closure that would go from 8.30 a.m. until 4 p.m. And the standard model for school streets internationally is a short closure at the start and end of the school day, but this school was, I think, more interested in having something consistent um, because of the changes in schooling and when kids are coming to school, when they're leaving. There's a lot of midday pickups right now because of the pandemic that they wanted to have something more consistent. And to help make it less confusing for the community and people in the neighborhood, um, the consistency of it just being closed to vehicles all day seemed simpler and like it might be better received by the community. Uh, and then to kind of implement it, I took the approach of many hands make light work. So what people could I bring into the project to get it off the ground? Um, how many people could we kind of spread these different tasks out to, to make it light work for those that are involved? And some of that involved bringing out the barricades in the morning, finding equipment that we needed, um, sourcing some different things, and then volunteers to actually run it day to day. So for the equipment, I thought it was really important that we have signage that kind of identifies the fact that this isn't a standard street closure. This isn't about um, construction, it's not about traffic monitoring in some ways, but it is, it, it's about kids, it's about kids' safety. So I wanted the barricades that we had to kind of highlight that it is about children's safety. So I worked with another local nonprofit, uh, Winnipeg Trails, who most of you might be familiar with, to make these brightly colored, fun looking barricades that go out every morning. And there's four of them, they're all different colors. And um, we did get reflective tape to put on it, which was really affordable, but still is reflective so people can see it. Um, and then we had these signs made with the traffic services at the city. So it was really exciting to the day that these signs went up. They're up on all four um, stop signs at the corners at the end of the street closure. And uh, this photo is in the snow because I took that this week. The street closure is still going really well. We're monitoring it weekly. Um, and so the street that's closed is a very short street. There is a map that I'll show you in a little bit. So after we kind of figure out how to do it, um, the staff at the school will take out barricades every day. And then how do we let the community know that this is happening? So we did a lot of promotion and communication and outreach with the community so that people weren't taken by surprise. Um, we sent letters home with all school families, and after the first week, we realized that there were some issues with where parents were stopping to let kids get out of the car or pick them up. So I made this map, which highlights this, the road closure. Um, that's Barrett Avenue that's closed between Spruce and Clifton, which is just a couple of blocks north of Portage. And for those of you who maybe don't know Portage, it's very busy. Um, it's an eight-lane highway. And um, so there is a lot of traffic that goes north-south. Beside, um, beside the school. 
So this map highlighted a no loading area because we were witnessing a lot of traffic congestion at the end of the street closure. Um, people were parking illegally between stop signs and doing a lot of bizarre things, um, a lot of illegal driving behavior. So this map was sent out a couple of times to families to help eliminate some of those confusing moments that were happening during pickup and drop off. Um, in the community, we sent out these flyers. Every single house on the neighboring streets received a flyer. And the people who lived on Barrett Avenue that was closed, I actually delivered a handwritten letter from me to make them feel like they're being included and that we really care about their input and how this will impact them. Um, I didn't get a single phone call. Everyone had my personal phone number and no one called. So I think this is a lot that if you give people enough information and a bit of a heads up that the transportation in their neighborhood might change, they're very open to doing things to support their community. And it's really difficult to argue with children's safety. So, you know, highlighting the good things that this can do for the community and the good things that it does for the students at Isaac Brock was a great way to um, win the support of people living in the neighborhood. We did a community launch event as well. It was really small because of COVID-19 restrictions, um, but it was an opportunity for stakeholders to see some of the students and for people in the community to come by and chat with people that were involved. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't there, so I don't have a ton of personal information about how it went. I was waiting on COVID-19 test results, um, which has been an ongoing struggle with trying to implement any new project right now is navigating these ever-changing uh, restrictions, especially with schools. So I'll cover really quickly some project evaluation and feedback. So we are in the midst of doing some feedback processes. We're looking at doing some focus groups with schools when we're able to get back into the school. Um, but at the early stages of, of September, when we had just started the school street, we sent a pre-survey out to parents to get an idea of how things might change given the street closure, but more than that, how things are going to change because of the pandemic and the change in busing. I think if you're going to incorporate a new initiative like this, you need to have a good idea of what's happening in the community and what's happening with those families. So we were anticipating a 19% increase in driving because school buses are not running for Isaac Brock right now. So that's a large number of cars that we are going to have to try to figure out how to move them. And then there's also a 5% increase in walking and rolling. Um, so we want to make sure that the kids that are walking or biking to school still feel like they're being supported with this increase in car traffic. Um, and we did a bike walk roll survey with a few of the classes. We're planning another one that will be really extensive for every single student um, starting next week. So early in September, we had a couple of classes do this bike walk roll survey. And we're seeing a 51% um, walk rate, which is pretty great. Uh, the one below is from the spring in 2019. So I'm not sure what the difference here is. There were 71% of students were walking in the spring of 2019. That's gone down quite a bit. But the number of students at the school has also changed a lot this year. Um, so it's, it's hard to know what the cause is there. And we wanted to make sure that we get some student feedback. So at the launch event, we did a democracy, and you can see here that the students that attended the event really liked the school street being there. Um, they think the street being closed to vehicles is a smiley thing, which is great. And I don't think anyone is too surprised by that. Um, kids like walking, kids like places to play. So of course they enjoy the street being closed. And anecdotally, we've got a lot of positive feedback from the teachers and the principal and vice principal at Isaac Brock. I meet with them almost weekly to see how it's going and they've said that it has just been really wonderful. We've seen an incredible shift in driving behavior already just in the last couple of weeks. Um, parents have gotten used to not being able to drive down Barrett Avenue so there's less congestion happening at either end of Barrett and people are parking about a block away maybe a bit, a bit more and walking that final block with their students. So they're getting a little bit of physical activity, even if the parents are driving them to school, they still get a little bit of time outside. And it means that that congestion is just getting um, dispersed a little bit. So there isn't a hot spot of any kind of issue. So that's been a really interesting thing to see in a very short amount of time. Um, I think because of the positive feedback that we've been getting and the fact that there has been zero complaints from the community, we're working on extending the pilot project. Um, I don't know how long that will be. It's still something that's in the works. 
initially we had planned on ending it on November 6th, so it's next Friday, um, but hopefully we'll get to extend it beyond that. And we have been looking at traffic patterns. We've been doing regular traffic counts um, at a couple of different intersections around the school to see how traffic is changing. And the majority of traffic is running north-south on Clifton. Um, and then a lot of the school traffic that you can tell as people dropping off students is on Spruce. So it's just information that is great for us to have to try to figure out if there is another issue of congestion just getting moved to another spot, how do we address that? And is there a way to um, help educate parents a bit better so that they can find a different location to drop people off. And administrative feedback, like I mentioned, the principal is really excited about it. Um, and Marla, last week when I talked to her, said it has been a wonderful thing for their school and they would really like to keep it. Um, so I will leave it there and I'm open to any questions. Um, Jen, you're on mute if you are saying anything. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Danae. I think it's amazing that you um, you were able to get this off the ground in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I think it was maybe the pandemic that helped get it off the ground. Um, could be, yeah. Yeah, people have been looking at streets in a very different way, and there's a lot more people open to using streets in a new capacity and sharing it more with people who are walking and biking, and I think right. that's a lot of why it was so well received. The open streets over this summer yeah. probably helped a lot with that. Yeah. Um, there is, a well, there's a state uh, a comment from Marie Soleil, which was great. And also Adam has a question. He's looking at Isaac Brock out of his window right now. <laughs> yeah. Do you think this technique would work on busier residential streets? On busier residential streets. So I guess if you're looking at a street with higher volumes of traffic, I think it could. You would need to um, provide maybe a bit more signage and a bit more information of where people could go instead. The volume of traffic on Barrett was really low to begin with, which is why it was selected as a good spot to try to pilot this in Winnipeg. Um, so a lot of that depends on having alternate routes. Um, are you going to be working really closely with the schools to kind of reduce the number of vehicles that are driving there? Such a large portion of vehicle traffic around schools is just people driving their children around. So I think a busy residential street could very quickly become a not busy residential street if those people stop driving their, their kids' places. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there might be other people that are on this call that could also talk a little bit about what to do on a busier street. Um, Rebecca Petrniak has been working really closely with me on that, and I have appreciated their support a lot. So um, yeah, I think it could work in a lot of different locations, and definitely a street like Barrett isn't the only one that would that would be able to work. Um, if I don't see any other questions, I do have one other to ask. Um, do you have any comments on how the pandemic has impacted school travel in Winnipeg as a whole? Yeah, so we have been working on a kind of a study citywide about how parents are changing their transportation behaviors and how children will be getting to school. And it looks like overall Winnipeg is looking at a really big increase in the number of kids that are being driven to school because of fears about carpooling, fears about being on the bus. Um, so it's something I think we need to figure out how to support schools with is how do we alleviate some of that influx in traffic? Um, how do we provide more locations for people to be dropping children off that is a safe space to do that? And how do we help um, schools with the really incredible amounts of congestion that are happening right in front of them. The street in front of a school is a very scary one at a pickup and drop off time and it's, it is very short, it's only a couple of minutes, like 10 minutes, but it makes it really scary to see kids trying to cross the street um, or try to get into their vehicle in the middle of the road. So a lot of that I think is also educating parents about other options. So can you park a block away, maybe pick a spot that your child can come meet you every day and you just park there instead. So I think there's some creative solutions, um, but Winnipeg needs to start coming up with a couple more innovative options or different things that we can put in the toolkit to use for them. And I think that a school street like the one at Isaac Brock has been really beneficial in 
helping move some of the road safety issues to to, to further away or displacing them completely. There isn't a road safety issue there anymore. So can we maybe do that at other schools along with a handful of other things that um, would work depending on the location of the school? Because this increase in vehicle traffic is going to be really difficult for a lot of schools citywide. Yeah, that's hard to hear that so many more kids are being driven. <laughs> yeah, like I, I think it's almost like a 75% increase at some schools. Um, and that's partially because of the change in busing of school buses have been canceled and yeah. people don't live even within their catchment. Like there are some people who go to school at a different school than what they're supposed to based on their location in the city. So, you know, if you have to travel seven kilometers, that's really far for a small child to do, even on a bike, especially in the winter. So um, I think you can't just expect people to stop driving, but what can we do to make those roads safe whether you're driving there or getting off a bus or biking, um, we're gonna have to start getting a little bit more creative. Yeah, uh, I think we, we're gonna have time to squeeze in one more question um, from Alexandra. Oh, this is for Marie, I see. Maybe we'll save that to the end, I'm sorry. And um, okay. then we'll move on. <laughs> so so thank, thank you. Today, um, we're gonna move on to our last but not least speaker, which is Jamie Hilland. Jamie is a sustainable transportation planner with Urban Systems and is the former program director of the Active and Safe Routes to School program at the Green Action Centre. Jamie is the current chair of Active School Travel Canada and sits on the expert advisory panel of the CIHR funded CHASE study at the University of Calgary that is examining how the built environment influences child active transportation and active transportation injury across Canada. Jamie's presentation today is entitled School Travel Planning as part of Neighborhood Studies and Design Projects in the City of Winnipeg. And Jamie, if you can share your screen. I can do that. Perfect. Can you see that right? Yep, looks good. Good to go. Thank you for doing the shortened uh, biography, by the way. <laughs> uh, so yes, hi everybody, thanks for having me. I will uh, try and be fast and efficient with the time here. And uh, for my presentation, uh, I just wanted to highlight a bit of the work that we've done uh, in communities across Canada. Obviously, my the first couple of years in, in this field, my work was focused uh, almost exclusively in the city of Winnipeg and had a, a lot of great success there and really enjoyed my time. And in the past couple of years, uh, three year anniversary, this, this actually this last past week, uh, I've had the opportunity to work on other projects across Canada and some some of the national scale. So, but it all comes back down to uh, how I got started was just running a, a walking school bus. And so these are my kids. They are a little bit older now, uh, but this is back when they were cute and didn't roll their eyes at me. So that was always a, a lovely time. But uh, this is what my wife and I did for a number of years. And uh, this was a solid crew. And we walked to, to Lower Secret School every day. And it was a, a lovely time. And really, and that is really uh, when it has sort of entrenched some of my opinions about uh, the need to improve the safety of children on their way to and from school and make it so that it was reducing the barriers to that. Um, this is really a big thing that I've sort of internalized uh, in, in my move over here is the need to really focus on uh, on engineering and this plays off of Marie Soleil's and Danae's points about uh, changes to the built environment are much bigger uh, indicators of uh, increasing walking uh, and biking rates and so engineering improvements alone will be 3.3 percent per year uh, whereas educational encouragement only give you about a one percent bump um, but if you combine the two uh, that's when you sort of get that magnifying effect and so really what we focused on in our school travel planning practice uh, has been combining the two. And that's where the power of sort of having the planners working with the engineers uh, in our school travel planning process uh, and some of the outcomes there have been really impactful. And that's what we, we really have been focusing on. These are some of the projects uh, that I personally have worked on or uh, am working on at, the, at present. And you can see some of them are in the cities, uh, some are in Ontario, some are in Alberta. A uh, big one that we've been doing for a couple of years is in British Columbia. And then we do a lot of the school travel planning for districts across uh, Metro Vancouver and, and, and beyond. Uh, I don't have them all listed, but that just gives you a bit of a highlight of some of the, the, the background that we're, we're doing here. 
a lot of it we do follow uh, the typical school planning travel planning process sometimes it's in a truncated uh, form so that it's a little bit quicker than what we typically see uh, looking at you know the one to two years in there uh, because a lot of these are part of neighborhood study and design projects which could have a timeline of anywhere of six to twelve months the first one that I will highlight this was done back in uh, in 2017 2018 was the Ruby Banning corridor study and you can see on the right hand side uh, of our, our corridor map there there was a lot of uh, schools along the corridor that we had to consider and so we actually she uh, did three school travel plans uh, for three of the schools, um, which was uh, General Wolf, uh, DMCI, and Greenway School to the south. The existing conditions at those schools were pretty strong. Uh, so that's Laura Secord on the left, which is one that we did not do a school travel plan at, but was part of the corridor. Uh, really high percentages of students walking and biking to school packed racks and then greenway we'd actually done a school travel plan up before and seen some changes to the built environment um, so they had really good sort of bones uh, already uh, but we were trying to establish and evaluate how we could improve that experience for them um, and so on the left you can see sort of the existing sidewalk network uh, was really well established in the area um, the cycling network is the middle map there, and you can see that really we were trying to consider how to link uh, that corridor with existing corridors extending to Health Sciences Center. And then on the right was sort of some of the collisions. As you can see, there's no great surprise. The greater the volumes, the, the greater the amount of collisions uh, along there, the vehicle collisions. And so improving those intersections was also a big piece of, of what we were trying to do. Uh, we were able to do um, school travel planning surveys and family surveys with, uh, with the students. And so from that, we were able to establish sort of um, the inner blue circle is, or sorry, the inner green circle is a 10 minute bike ride and the inner blue circle is a 10 minute walking distance. And so we were trying to see how many students actually lived in proximity and what their mode of transportation was. And this gives a good snapshot of sort of like uh, their transportation mode choices based on proximity to the school. And so this one is for DMCI. Uh, and then this one is for General Wolf School which is a middle school uh, in the area. And you can see a large cluster of students that lived within that walk zone. And it really uh, correlates to the distance from the school. Uh, one of the neat things that we did for this project is we had a number of students, and this was a, a, a bike club that I helped run called the Flaming Cheetahs. Uh, we rode the corridor. Uh, and immediately afterwards, we the kids uh, sort of gave testimonials on their experience and the families of riding the corridor and what intersection improvements or what street improvements they would like to see. Uh, and we felt that sort of that lived experience and trial of the, of the corridor uh, was a really valuable exercise. We also did something that it was kind of neat and I don't know has been done before since was we um, did a sort of tactical urbanism event it was one of the first in the city back in 2017. We did a 2.3 kilometer continuous line drawing extending from uh, Preston or Palmerston to the south all the way up to Wellington Avenue. And really we were trying to establish the, the connectivity and, the, and the, the breaks in that connectivity and the connection between the four schools along the corridor. Um, and so it was a great project. We had, uh, this, this is Winnipeg School Division staff that are on the left. We had the, the cadets come out and help us, which was awesome. And then of course I uh, shanghaied my two children into being willing painting participants for the day. My track has never been the same, but uh, it, was a, it was a great project. Uh, and then the next day after we painted it, we had the students come in and actually color in uh, the, the lines that were on the streets. The community feedback was really, really positive to this one. Uh, a lot of people taking pictures and, and, and starting that conversation about how we view our streets and perception of it. Uh, we did a play street uh, at four uh, of the schools along the corridor. Um, and the one you're seeing on the left is at uh, Lower Secord there. We did that for that day, which was awesome. And then that center picture there is students actually rode up and down the corner and just met the students at the other school, which is something that had never been done. And really, it talked about uh, some of the barriers that these major corridors can have, uh, especially for the students living on the south and north side of a major corridor like Portage Avenue. They never considered sort of going and making that connection. And then the top one on the top right is the MCI students really did a fantastic job of, of decorating their streets and, and did some really creative artwork. In the evening of that day, we also had a, a, an open house uh, with a lot of advertising and a lot of feedback. We had a great turnout. Uh, the top right is the local councillor brought pizza out. So really free pizza that she gave away for everybody, uh, which really drew the crowds. And then the bottom right is the, the Flaming Cheetahs did a bike demonstration. So got a lot of kids at Greenway School uh, really excited and, and a lot of parents talking about it. What we did in the end is uh, we, we came up with a design that we thought was appropriate for the corridor and that was a, a greenway design and so we talked about the level of comfort, uh, keeping traffic volumes uh, uh, slow, sorry, or sorry, keeping traffic slow and volumes low. 
uh, and making intersection improvements. And so these are just some of the highlights of some of the, the engineering and built environment improvements that we really uh, recommended for this project. And so this is at uh, the, uh, near Daniel McIntyre Collegiate Institute. So that's Wellington Avenue and then uh, that's Banning at that, that, that intersection there. Moving to the south, this is General Wolf School, and so much the same as we recommended, basically some intersection improvements, potentially directional closures, uh, and then mountable islands as well, uh, just really to dissuade traffic from traveling the length of that corridor. And then this is right near uh, Greenway School on St. Matthews, so much the same treatments as, as we recommended. And lastly, was near Wolseley Avenue, which is a raised intersection uh, and then also a partial closure treatment uh, right in front of the school. The next project that uh, we'll, I'll, I'll discuss quickly is the West Alexander East Exchange, and this was done back sort of around the same time uh, in 2018. Uh, and this one was interesting because school travel planning was not part of the original um, scope of the of the RFP, but the schools along here really uh, advocated for participation and input into the process. And so we were brought in to sort of discuss with the schools what they would be looking at and do sort of a really quick uh, engagement process with them as well. So one thing that we did was we did a, um, we talked with the schools obviously, but we did a pop-up protected bike lane right near the schools uh, on a one day event, which was a, a lot of fun. And we built, I think Chris uh, is on the call here, the first protected, or sorry, first turning or bike box uh, in the city. I don't know if we have any since then, but that was one of the first temporary ones that we did with using tar paper and uh, some temporary spray chalk, which was kind of fun. Um, the students at Hugh John McDonald were huge into it. Uh, they got to try the bike lane, provide direct feedback to us. We had a lot of community members come up just to see what the, the all the fuss was about. Uh, and that was a good engagement opportunity. We also had uh, uh, adaptive bikes provided to us from uh, Freedom Concepts as well. Um, and you can see there's a good shot of Chris Baker uh, giving it away there uh, on the adaptive bike. Uh, in the bottom left, we set up a, an open house at Old Market Square. And then the last piece that we did, which was, was kind of neat, was we actually had local artists come in and paint the lanes. And that was just an effort to really highlight uh, their opening and that they were open to people um, and, and really good facilities to start using. Um, and so the proposed design, uh, we, we did change some elements based upon feedback from the schools. So the, the one on the, the map on the left here is um, at Sacre Coeur School. And so they were really pushing for uh, intersection improvements, um, particularly at the west end of the corridor there. And so we actually did install uh, curb bump outs there with a, a raised pedestrian crosswalk. And you can see that in this one here. Um, and that made them quite uh, quite pleased about the whole thing. And, and I'm not sure if that would have not happened or would have happened without uh, sort of direct engagement. Uh, the third one we'll talk about is the Wolsey to Downtown Quarter Study, which we are presently doing detailed design for. So this is a highlight of the area, but you can see along the bottom there, there are four uh, schools along that, that corridor. Um, and so we did school travel planning at three of them at Wolsey School, Lower Secret School, and Mulvey School. Um, this was the quick process. I won't go through it all, but uh, we did a, a lot of program setup, data collection. Uh, we did visioning workshops with them. We did a lot of design, direct design consideration. Uh, and then we wrote a, a report on it that helped inform that, that design. We also did a online family survey to identify, uh, this is a cycling issues one, and we had almost 300 responses from families along the corridor. Um, this was pedestrian issues, and you can see we had a lot really, of really intersection specific uh, and quarter specific uh, pieces that we were able to incorporate into our final design and great feedback. These were the uh, bike walk roll results that we, we did. And so we had a week where we coordinated doing surveys with all the schools, and we had almost a thousand uh, answers recorded. And so you can see that these schools uh, have actually fairly good rates of active transportation already. So Mulvey School is the top left, uh, Laura Secret's the top right, uh, and then Wolsey School's at the bottom. Uh, and the numbers that really sort of jumped out a bit to us was Wolsey School is, is, is located in a really great residential area, but still had a fairly high number of, of vehicles driven. And so part of our strategy was to try and shift that a little bit more. Uh, two things that we also did, we uh, got the students to do, almost every student uh, at all the classes, especially in the older grades, we did a design workshop um, and where they got to design what sort of roads they would like to see. And we considered turning movements and all those pieces. And that really helped inform some of our feedback from the students. And then on the right, we got each student to do a drawing of their, their route to school. And so that exercise is really interesting. And we were trying to not only establish what their, their typical patterns were, but also the perceptions of those journeys. 
And so the perception of this one, this is a student at Laura Secord who walks to school every day. Uh, and you can see that their map is rarely detailed and rich uh, with a lot of great uh, community connections and community recognition and, and, and placemaking there. Um, and the second map, this is uh, a student who is driven every day. And this is maybe a bit of exaggeration, but uh, there's a lot of uh, maps like this that came out of this process. And so that really highlighted sort of some of the importance of being able to walk and bike in your community to make that connection. These are some of the pictures from the walkabouts and visioning workshops that we did. So the one on the left is students at Mulvey, and they were really interested, uh, and we did a, a great community walkabout with them. The top is at uh, Wolsey School, and we had great parent turnout for some of the visioning workshops. And then Wolsey School, again, is on the right, uh, a good walkabout. And then the middle here is the, the Laura Secord uh, walkabout, which was probably one of the most uh, packed ones that I've been to. And obviously, we collected a ton of feedback from both parents, administration, and students. We also did a uh, design charrette with city staff using a lot of that information at the school, which really helped to, to give a lot of the focus towards improving conditions for students at the three students along the corridor. Um, and so these are some of our fun maps that we always use. And ultimately, we came out with a design. This is for the uh, east section of the corridor that is presently in the detailed design phase, as you can see, that considers a lot of the needs of the students, especially along the Belmoral Street uh, and Westminster Corridor. There was a few students uh, at Mulvey School in particular who have been struck by vehicles in that section. And so we are really focusing on making a design that improves uh, some of the, the, the safety outcomes for those students. Uh, and next I'll talk about uh, City of Windsor real quick. We did their active transportation strategy back in 2017, 2018. Um, the map here, so it's a citywide one, but we definitely had a, a large focus on active school travel uh, as a potential. Um, and so the map on the right is travel to school potential. And that was really what we tried to, to focus on as a big component of this. As part of that, we focused on one of the major high schools and we did an event there. Uh, and it doesn't really show on the map here, but uh, this corridor here between Glenwood and Vincent Massey, they actually made a decision to take green space and soccer fields away from the students and they punched a driveway for dropping off students down the middle of the green uh, space that was normally used on by students. And you can see that drop off laneway there uh, in Google Street View, it's not showing on the maps yet, but it was uh, something that was really concerning to a lot of folks that were trying to prioritize active transportation is that they made it so easy uh, to drop off students that they had an enormous surge in the number of students being driven to school because it was a much easier concept. And so we actually did a school streets pilot back in the spring of 2018 on this one. Uh, where we had students come out and we barricaded traffic for the day. Uh, a lot of community engagement on that one. We solicited some students sort of what they would like to see. Uh, and we also went and talked to parents who were dropping off students or picking up students in the afternoon and asked them for some of their reasons for uh, making that trip. And that really helped inform um, some of the strategy outcomes that we came with. And so one of our big strategy outcomes was to focus on active school travel and age-friendly planning. And this was adopted by City Council uh, in the spring of 2019. And so some of these actions are already being implemented. So that's been a great benefit of seeing this one, uh, this project. Um, the next one I'll highlight really quickly is the City of Calgary we did. Uh, this is North Mountain Drive. We were asked to do a detailed design for this project to look at installing cycling facilities. Uh, the yellow icons there are schools, and you can see there's a lot of schools along the corridors, uh, a lot of marked crosswalks, and we were trying to demonstrate what is possible uh, along this section. We did a, a design workshop with a lot of the students where they were able to sort of design their own streets, uh, which was a really fun, uh, innovative exercise. And then we also did a... Uh, sort of a tactical urban event where students were traced out their footprints uh, and their typical routes. And so we traced those and marked those on the sidewalk. And then the following day, we held a sort of a, an open streets event uh, at the school. We did tours where we set up temporary bike lanes uh, with a lot of the students at the school. Uh, and then we collected feedback on their experiences. Ultimately, we came out with a design that, that looks at unidirectional facilities uh, and protective facilities along the length of it, uh, especially around the schools. And really, that helped make the case based on that, those feedback from those students at those schools. And then lastly, I'll talk quickly. This is a project we've been working on for a while. This is with Transnet Go to Metro Vancouver. And so they have asked us to develop their regional active school travel strategy. So we've done a lot of the groundwork. We did a, a municipal survey with 16 of the municipalities, a lot of interviews. We actually studied also active school travel programs across the country. So Ottawa, uh, the, the CRD, which is in Victoria, Winnipeg, Metrolinx, and then in, in Quebec. Um, we also looked specifically at some of the outcomes at school travel planning process at, at three of the schools to see what the impact was of those. We did an agency survey and then we did a number of workshops. 
a lot of the things we came out with uh, recommending are, are specifically, we're number one, we're a infra dedicated infrastructure fund that focuses on making those improvements that are outcomes of school travel planning process. A lot of our past STPs that we've done have not resulted in changes to the built environment, and you're not seeing that mode shift. So that was one of the big things that we really felt was a priority and we focused on. Um, we also talked about the, the bike education and skills training program that we've, we've done here in Winnipeg for the past couple of years, which has been a really nice success. Um, we're piloting a walking school bus program uh, starting in January 2020. We're also looking at doing some school streets pilots as well through that. Um, more and better coordinated and recurring uh, school travel mode data collection because it's just a big gap. We don't know what the numbers are there. And so that was a big piece that we're looking at. And then we also looked at uh, examples like the city of Toronto, where we looked at the, where the active and safe school programs are integrated within city administration. Um, and we felt that that was from some of those outcomes are a particularly effective uh, intervention um, because a lot of times it's been the uh, it's environmental NGOs that are trying to advocate for changes to the built environment and they're, they can be dismissed a little bit easier. So part of what we're advocating for is that a lot of the municipalities have ASRTS staff integrated within their departments. And that's something that we've recommended. The other big outcome that we did was uh, a tactical urban toolkits um, because we've seen a lot of demand for those pilots. And so Winnipeg is featured on the cover of a tactical urban toolkit for Metro Vancouver. So we can all smile about that a little bit. Uh, but it's been really well received and, and quite popular. And we've seen a few municipalities already there piloting those um, tactical urbanism events, particularly outside of schools. And that was a big focus for us. And lastly, I just wanted to sort of talk to um, what's happening at a nation, national level. Um, and so Active School Travel Canada is a, is a loose network of active school travel professionals from across the country. And really, we're working with uh, Green Communities Canada, Canada Walks, Heart and Stroke Foundation, CAA, FCM to, to push and guide the federal government as they develop the active transportation strategy uh, for Canada. Uh, and so a lot of good uh, discussions and, and, and input. Uh, they have definitely had a lot of discussions with us. So that's been great. Um, and two programs I did want to highlight uh, BC Healthy Communities is being uh, funded by the provincial government to do some programming pilots there. Uh, what they're doing is $10,000 per school, uh, and they're they're doing programming alone with no infrastructure funding, um, and so that's a bit of a challenge for them as well. And the same with Ontario Active School Travel. They're provincially funded. They have a bigger budget, and they get about uh, $50,000, sorry, $60,000 per program this year, but it is focused solely on, on programming initiatives, and so that's been something, a barrier that they've really both recognized uh, as, as being a major impediment to seeing those changes. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to highlight, this is some of our cheetahs when I asked them to set up a protected bike lane. Uh, kids are great uh, and important stakeholders that we should make sure that we're engaging with, but sometimes that needs a bit of a filter um, to make sure that's a, a successful outcome. And that's it. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, it's so great to see all those pictures of kids um, involved in designing and planning their or school travel planning. Um, I don't see any questions yet that have come in, but one I have is, in your opinion, what can be done to improve the school travel planning process? Uh, I think more municipal involvement, to be honest, that would be the, the big thing that, that I've seen um, and the, the greatest successes. Uh, we're doing one for the township of Langley and they're the, the client. And so it's a, a different, uh, an interesting project for us uh, to work with their transportation team to come up with recommendations and changes to the built environment they're actually willing to undertake. Uh, so I think that's what I would, I would recommend as sort of a, a major peak component I'd like to see changed in school travel planning, not incurring in isolation, but in conjunction and planning with uh, municipal engineers uh, in particular. Okay, um, maybe we'll actually go on to that um, question that came in for Marie during the last presentation. If you're okay with that, Marie? Yeah. Did the study look at whether kids were distracted by phones or other devices while crossing? And were there specific types of pedestrian crossings that saw more interactions with vehicles versus other sites? Okay, so for the first part, um, uh, we we did look at phones, but elementary school, like we, I, I don't recall seeing any. The distraction for those kids were other kids, you know, they were just like chit chatting if they were walking with their friends, for instance. So sometimes they would get to the crossing and uh, we wouldn't really realize they were at the crossing, you know, so they would do sometimes 
a step up, a step forward, and then a step back because you're like, oh, hold on, we're there, you know. <laughs> but <clears throat> but even um, you know, the cell phone distraction, even for adults, it was it was not that many from what we've seen, and seniors was all, pretty much absent also. Um, I think it was 10%, so it was not a major phenomenon we saw in terms of distraction. In terms of types, of specific types, all those types of, of crossings, uh, we don't have them that much here. We don't have flashing beacon that much. So we didn't see anything. It was really between the stop sign ones. We saw all, We saw actually some improvement where the pavement was different. Sometimes it was like red bricks or fake bricks. Sometimes, you know, it's just a marking that is different. So it was if it was another color or um, uh, another um uh, material it was actually less there was less interactions at those spots but in terms of of um flashing beacon or above type of thing of, of of thing we didn't see anything in Quebec because there's not enough but I've seen other studies in the states that said that uh, it, sometimes it, went, it was more dangerous but the problem is that those huge flashing beacons with with a push button they were on major roads and it was a push button so people were not pushing it all the time and so it was like not because of the light I mean the traffic signal but because of all the rest basically so I wasn't I, I'm not sure about like what's the most efficient here basically. <laughs> Great. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I think we're probably ready to sign off. I want to thank our three speakers, Jamie, Danae, and Marie Soleil. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to put a presentation together and sharing it with all of us. Um, thanks very much, everyone else, for joining in. and. Remember to please let us know if you'd like to join our 2021 executive um, for ITE Manitoba. We'd love to have you. Um, have a good afternoon, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you in person one day soon. Thank you. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye.